The next thing <laughs> that I want to look at is Hive Science, and this will wrap up the show. I'm actually trying to see if I can't uh, whittle it down a little bit because I'm going to go into my Discord after show and uh, invite everybody who's a member of the Discord in to uh, participate. So, yeah, uh, that'll be happening right after this section here. So, oh, Bugbot is stinging and stinging out there. All right, so this is kind of a this is a story about little brain bug or little brain bug. I can't. Well, I guess I was brain bug back then. Little Bree, I was a uh, when I was a child. I remember seeing this image so clear of this tortoise. It's a reconstruction, of course, because this was a tortoise that could not be alive today. Because if it was alive, I would have known about it. Because I was like into all the animals, and if this monster had lived in my time. I would have known about it. I would have seen pictures of it. I would have had books about it because it was such a weird creature. But uh, we are going to be looking at this bizarre organism. I remember seeing this reconstruction of a tortoise, but it had tusk or fangs so clear in my mind. I remember seeing it. I remember the shell. I know it was a tortoise, damn it. I know it was a tortoise. I told my brother about it because we had all the same books growing up. We thumbed through them together. No, no, he doesn't remember any tortoise with fangs. And one of the uh, distinctive qualities of a tortoise is they don't have teeth. And it's of a turtle in general, of a testuidine, which is uh, turtles, uh, tortoises, and people are like, oh, that's a you go to the, the, the zoo or whatever, and you say, oh, that's a cute turtle, and uh, you're in the tortoise, and you're looking at the tortoises. Someone comes over and corrects you. Um, that's a tortoise, not a turtle. You can take a deep breath and say, tortoises are in the clade testuidine. An order of reptiles known as testuidines. Testuidine is the scientific name for turtle. So tortoises are a type of turtle. Just like sea turtles are a type of turtle. So it's okay. It's okay to it's okay to call a tortoise a turtle. It's not always okay to call any tor turtle a tortoise though. Because tortoises are nested in inside of turtles uh yes this tortoise has fangs but i photoshopped this to show you the image that was inside my head and i looked and looked all over the place no no fanged tortoises I found lots of fanged other things okay why are you not doing the slide my slideshow is broken. Hold on. Give me just a moment here. Sorry. I guess it's not going to work. Hmm. That's all right. Uh, I can do. do. Hmm. I think I used the wrong template for that. So, man, first episode of Hive Science are uh, are going to be uh, full of bugs. Sorry. We will, uh, we'll, I'll just go on with this, uh, with this image up here. It's fine. This does punctuate just fine what I'm talking about. Uh, so I found lots of organisms that have weird select representatives that do have fangs where the rest of them normally don't. Uh, musk deer are, uh, bovids with fangs. Musk deer are not deer. They're actually closer related to... Let me see if I can do that at least. Pull up some of these different organisms. 
maybe we'll do it that way i hate to just have it popping up on chrome like that but so yeah musk deer uh have fangs we have uh hyrex these weird little guys have fangs tusks these are actually close related to elephants so these are you know the same genes that allow elephants to to grow their big tusk of course we all know boars have tusk elephants have tusk walruses have tusk uh tusk are a pretty normal feature in a lot of mammals not so much in in uh reptiles though not so much in diapsids and yes turtles there was a speculation early on that that turtles were going to be this other group called anapsids which did exist a long time ago but have no surviving relatives but it came to find out that uh the tortoises turtles are just they're diapsids they're just it's fused so they're they're well within diapsids now diapsids could loosely be used to say these are reptiles um but also includes birds and archosaurs and lepidosaurs so depends on how you want to use it and if you want to use i use i use it as reptile as a synonym for uh for diapsids so if you hear me say reptile i'm i mean diapsids i mean birds and snakes and lizards uh anything that's a diapsid is going to be a reptile to me uh and then we're therapsids uh we are actually synapsids. We are a group called therapsids in the middle of it. But I'm getting on a tangent here. Uh, tortoises and turtles are synapsids. And you don't see too many tusks in synapsids. There are some exceptions. There's the uh, esteemed boar croc, if anybody's familiar with this monstrosity of an animal. This was a crocodile with huge uh, protruding tusk and fangs looked something like this in life very very much like a boar so not unheard of but you cannot find you cannot find a turtle with with fangs you can check out the inside of a leatherback sea turtle's mouth which is freaking wicked look at that you wouldn't want to stick your hand in there you can see their razor tipped beaks in some of these predatory turtles here that are it's ready to chomp down on whatever they're uh, they're munching on but no teeth because turtles don't have teeth they're beaked and they have very powerful beaks some of the most powerful beaks in the animal kingdom belong to members of the testuidine like these alligator snapping turtle here with its sheer cutting edge that could snip your finger right off if you gotta get in its grip but no fangs no fangs just maybe uh serrated edges to uh the inner side of the beak no teeth no f nothing that could be even close to it to tusk right nothing nothing at all however i distinctly remember so I'm like maybe it was a tortoise maybe it was a specifically a tortoise so you know, let's look up tortoise and see if tortoise has fangs nope stay the same pictures come up the same images nothing familiar at all none of these look like the animal that I saw I mean you got some goofy stuff like this people put fake teeth in the tortoise's mouth but no real teeth at all. Maybe it wasn't. Maybe it wasn't fang. Maybe they had them listed as tusks. So are they tusk? Tortoise with tusk? No. That's why I had to make my own image of a tortoise with tusk. Hey, girl. Good to see ya. I had to create my own image of tor a tortoise with tusk because you can't find one. You can't find a turtle with tusk either. Look turtle with tusk no no turtle with tusk it's a dead end a dead end I mean we have some art of an elephant with a turtle shell which would be a tur tur uh, turtle with tusk 
but no actual turtle with tusk at all. I don't know what that was. Oh, I was linked on that jewelry. Um, it was a dead end. A dead end. I don't know where else to look. And I talked to my brother about it. Uh, again, because we had shared all the same books and stuff. And they're like, hey, are you sure you're not thinking of this? You sure you're not thinking of this turtle with tusk? Hmm. Was I thinking about Gamera? Was I picturing Gamera in my head? Is that what was what I was remembering? Gamera does have teeth. Very much. Very much a turtle with its shell and all. But I remember the tusk going down. I remember it being a reconstruction of a real animal. Not standing up, bipedal. It's actually a turtle. It's on all fours. Gamera flying? No, it wasn't Gamera flying. Gamera did walk on all fours in some scenes, but no, it was more, it was much more realistic. No offense to uh, Kaiju Sudimation, but uh, Gamera, at least the ones that were around by the time that I remember seeing this when I was a kid, no, you wouldn't recognize that this was a suit. What I saw was like a reconstruction. I couldn't remember what it was made of, though. It might be a monochrome. A monochrome reconstruction. <sighs> so it was a dead end, right? I couldn't find anything about it in years. You kind of pushed it to the back of my mind. Because what are you going to do? What are you going to do? You can't make yourself remember something. If you don't remember, you don't remember it. The best thing I usually can think to do when that situation comes down is put it out of my mind. Because then it will come back to me. And I'll be like, that is, uh, that is what I was thinking of. This time it didn't, and years went by, because this was years ago. I never could figure it out. Never could quite pin down what this animal was. So, a few, uh, must have been a few weeks back, uh, maybe a couple months back, did a part where we went to Crystal Palace. We went to Crystal Palace is in the early reconstruction parks for dinosaurs. There's all these concrete sculptures of, uh, of different dinosaurs. It's in the UK. Uh, I would love to be able to visit it someday. Huge. Some of them are huge. They got a, uh, they're, they're completely inaccurate, inaccurate. Like they have the iguanodons, which are basically depicted as just giant iguanas. Uh, just huge, monstrous, uh, you know, nine foot tall iguanas. Uh, they didn't stand upright. None of the <laughs> none of the dinosaurs were bipedal in Crystal Palace. They were all depicted as quadrupeds. And the Megalosaurus is particularly it's my personal favorite of the Crystal Palace reconstructions because it's so out there compared to how we predict them or how we depict them now. It had a very uh, like a cross between a Komodo dragon and a hyena on this build. It was a, it's a wild looking creature. There are so many cool animals in Crystal Palace. Yeah, the TMNT did have teeth too. I remember that. I remember because they had like the, the toys had the sides. Because I remember how to draw them. You would draw like a figure eight and put the teeth on either side. Um, when I was a kid, drawing Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles was just kind of the thing you did. <laughs> Uh, anyway, so Crystal Palace is full of all these outdated reconstructions of different organisms. They have, you know, the swan-necked plesiosaurs, uh, the hyena Komodo dragon hybrid megalosaurus, giant iguanas for iguanodons. Uh, a lot of wild animals depicted in a lot of wild ways. Now, uh, what does this have to do with our mystery tortoise? Our mystery turtle. Well, <laughs> it actually has everything to do with it because saber tooth turtles impossible. The most challenging paleontological jigsaw at Crystal Palace Parks. Now this is from 2014, so this has been out for a while. Now it just never popped up on my feed, but here they are. This is the exact image that I was thinking of, specifically the one on the left here, but uh yeah, I do remember the shell, the tusk, everything about this just seems so, so weird. I love uh, Crystal Palace Ring. I'm not going to bash it one bit. 
because uh, it was an early endeavor into paleo art. It was a groundbreaking endeavor, and I am uh, still impressed with uh, the things that they they got right, and I'm impressed with the things they speculated on, even if they got it wrong. That's how science works. Uh, But here we are. They are... Let's see. This is an author, uh, Dr. Simon Jackson. These are supposed to be representations of dicynodons. We'll talk about dicynodons here in a minute. Uh, This guy had previously done a... Here, are you going to get back up here or not? Sorry, my little mantis friend is wanting to uh, climb around. Uh... So, left of this, Hawkins' illustration, was to prove an even greater challenge, perhaps the hardest of the Crystal Palace dinosaurs. Alright, so this is the uh, image that Hawkins had to work with when he was building his sculptures. He's the sculptor, the guy who built the structures in Crystal Palace. This is the uh, image that they had of Dicynodon. All they had of Dicynodon at the time was a skull. We'll read on. Watercolor painting of Triassic animals by Benjamin Waterhouse Hawkins, undated but from 1853. Dicynodonts are on the far left. This is given the disclaimer about uh, fair use. When you see dinosaurs in production, such as Jurassic Park and Walking with Dinosaurs. That kind of dates this too because we have Prehistoric Planet now and I'm only on episode one ring. You need to kick my butt. Um, I only have so many hours in the day and I want to give it the due focus that I have and every time I try to start watching it, I fall asleep because I'm elderly. (laughs) Um, Or the animal statues at Crystal Palace Park. It is easy to forget that what you see is the end product of a process. A process built piece by piece by scientists and artists. All paleontologists struggle with the same problem, reconstructing an animal with a few bones or parts. It's like putting together a jigsaw, but from only a few pieces. And to make it harder, there's no picture on the box to follow. The famous British Anatomist Richard Owen was particularly good at these types of puzzles. Perhaps his most famous example was in 1839 when he was able to predict the existence of a huge, unknown, flightless bird in New Zealand from a fragment of a femur alone. Although his supposition was not intentionally or initially accepted, by all of the scientific community, he was proved right three years later when he was able to reconstruct the Dinornis, more commonly known as the Moa, from more complete material. Thus, Owen's reputation was vindicated and even fabled, and the photograph of him standing next to the complete Moa skeleton is his triumphant I told you so moment. It appeared he could wield the same predictive powers as mathematicians and astronomers. So that's the early days of paleontology and understanding how to reconstruct these things. This guy right here was the man. This was the guy with his uh, arcane robes and whatnot. Uh, he was also very a religious zealot, so he didn't really... Uh, didn't really believe in evolution. Richard Owens is a is an odd character. We could uh, dig more into that at some point. All right. Uh, Professor Owens and his reconstruction Dinornis, taken in 1877. Owens' reputation also reached South Africa. In 1844, whilst constructing military roads in the Cape of Good Hope, Mr. Andrew Geeds Bain, road engineer and geologist, had discovered some highly unusual skulls. Curious to find out exactly what they were, he transmitted the material to the geological, I always want to say zoological society of London, the geological society of London, with a request 
would, that Owen would undertake their description. Of course, Owen eagerly accepted the challenge. This was another opportunity for him to apply his puzzle-solving skills. Another chance to describe a new type of animal. However, he could not have anticipated the strange animal he was about to uncover. The strange character, which struck Owen with a sharp pointed tusk projecting from the skull, obvious feature which formed the basis of Bane's initial name for them, by dentals. These tusks he compared to those of a walrus, borrowed, as it were, from the mammalian class. As the hard sandstone was painstakingly removed under Owen's keen supervision, other strange features of the skull became more apparent. The front of the upper and lower jaw, Owen deduced, were sheathed with a horn forming a bill like that of a turtle. But turtles do not have tusk, Owen noted, making the Dicynodon a very strange animal indeed. A chim chimera, which may have reminded him of the platypus creature from Australia. I don't like that speculation. I don't know if uh, Owen would have, uh, if Owens would have, if he would have been able to uh, even assess this to being anything closely related to a platypus or similar to a platypus at all. I don't know if he would make that inference. The only other clue that Owen had were a few vertebrae, but from which Owen concluded that Dicynodon had an aquatic, perhaps marine, lifestyle. Which, he's making the inference, with the walrus, that's where you're going to go with it. Uh, illustration of Dicynodon, Lacerticeps, skull, in Owen's 1845 report on the reptilian fossil of South Africa. Now in the case of the MOA, Owen was able to, able to, able to, eh, typo, was able to reconstruct the animal from just one fragment using the technique of functional correlation to determine that a particular kind of bird, upper leg bone, was associated with a particular kind of lower leg bone, and so on until the entire animal was built. This principle worked well when a complete skeleton of a closely related animal, the ostrich in the case of the moa, was known, which provided Owen a freight with a framework, or if you like, the picture on the front of the jigsaw puzzle box. However, when the remains of a completely new creature, such as Dicynodon, were found, this picture simply did not exist. The same kind of references were not there. Presented with such a strange mix of features, Owen seems to have been unwilling to state his reputation I think it's supposed to be stake his reputation, maybe? His reputation on what the actual creature looked like, judging from the absence of any scientific whole animal illustration of his, like the labyrinthodont, uh, or labyrinthodont, not specifically the labyrinthodont. Uh, see below, that's the image that we see down there. The paleontologist in him was simply waiting for more fossils. More evident or yeah, more evidence to guide him through putting the jigsaw together. But in this case, there simply wasn't time. The statue of the Dicynodon was to be erected in the famous Crystal Palace Park less than 10 years later in 1854 by the artistic hands of famous sculptor, 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 Benjamin Waterhouse Hawkins. And the reconstruction was needed now. Hawkins worked closely with Owens in creating many of the statues, making smaller maquettes. That's like what they use in uh, stop-motion animation, for instance, and 
the reconstruction was needed. Okay, where were we? Ah, uh, mad cats, mad cats. Okay, of some of of some animals to seek Owen's scientific approval before scaling them up to create the finished statues. However, as far as we know, and we would like to be proved wrong, there is no such miniature model of Dicynodon. This raises the question: What kind of conversation, if any, was taking place between sculptor? and scientific consultant on this particular project. Was Hawkins on his own with the Dicynodon reconstruction? We know from studying Hawkins' illustrations, he held the he held in the Natural History Museum Pictures Library Archives that Hawkins illustrated the Dicynodon with the head emerging above the horizon. So clearly Hawkins did not know how to illustrate the rest of the body. Well, we see it back here peeking over the edge. That was the plan just to have the head poking up. Benjamin Waterhouse Hawkins sketch, restoration of animals. Yeah, that's just citation for the picture. But in order to breathe life into the extinct animal, and to fit the missing pieces of the jigsaw puzzle, Hawkins would have to edge further into the dark of the speculation zone, even if Owen was not prepared to. Now, Hawkins, too, was a scientist, or at least was a student of scientific work of Owen and the famed anatomist Baron Georges Cuvier. Could he also apply the same logical principles that served Owen so well in reconstructing the Moa? If the head of the Dicynodon animal was like the, that of a turtle with a beak, then should not the body also be like that of a turtle with a shell? And that is exactly what we see in the statues. Two Dicynodon statues at Crystal Palace. This image right here is what haunted my childhood. Good morning, Purple. Uh -huh. It is also highly probable that Owen's interpretation of the Dicynodon as an amphibious animal based upon the nature of the vertebrae also influenced this reconstruction of Hawkins. But why did Hawkins not choose to base his Dicynodon body reconstruction on the walrus, given that significant tusks were a more prominent feature of Owen's description? I think this is to do with Hawkins' chronological sequence of animals in the park. Cuvier's large extinct mammals, such as the mammoth and mastodon, had been retrieved in a much younger tertiary deposit than the Dicynodon, and Hawkins had planned to show the to show representatives of animals in separate parts of the park. Tertiary Island is where you find the mammoths. So the suggestion that a walrus-like animal lived in a much more ancient time, as was represented by Dicynodon and other animals on the secondary island, would have been met by ridicule. So Turtle may have won out simply because it fit into the accepted chronological time fr uh, framework. Okay, so what did Owen think then of this strange saber-toothed turtle? We can really only speculate, but if his comments in 1854 Geology and Inhabitants of the Ancient World Guide he supposedly wrote is anything to go by, Mr. Hawkins has taken upon himself to the responsibility of adding the trunk to the known characters of the head. It seems Owen very much left Hawkins to the reconstruction of the Dicynodon body and then wanted to distance himself from it. I think that's a little bit of a stretch. I think that that's a uh, inference the author is making here. I don't know if I would say that he's trying to distance himself from it. He's saying... What he's saying, from what I gather, is an artist is going to do art. They have to they have to fill in the blanks. Have to fill in that blank area. As we briefly touched on in a previous 
uh, article on the Labyrinth Dot, Owen is often credited more for the creation of the Crystal Palace statues, but at least in these two instances, we see that these jigsaw puzzles have been put together, not just by scientists, but also by artists. In fact, this is the way that paleontological jigsaws today are often put together. The paleontologists place the pieces which make up the bones, muscles, and in some rare cases, skin and body coverings. The final pieces for creating the living flesh out jigsaw will be put into the place by artists. No, not necessarily, because uh, the way that muscles and fat and all this stuff attaches to the bone, we can tell. And then, of course, we know organs and stuff inside. So when reconstructing these, the artist does need to understand how muscle attachment works. They need to understand what this muscle is going to be attached to, what bone this muscle is going to be attached to. Although for Dicynodon, Hawkins seems to have placed a large pot of the jigsaw, the shell himself. <laughs> yeah, although it is tempting to perhaps judge Hawkins rather harshly with, you got it wrong, we must remember that very little material that he was working with, there is nothing like the Dicynodon with its strange mix of features alive today. We now think these animals were more closely related to mammals than turtles. Yes, we're going to get into that in a sec second here. Most importantly, the Hawkins reconstruction still stands 160 years later as a living testament to the changing process of science. Reconstructions change with new discoveries and theories, so we can go back and question older reconstructions or ideas critically. We can say we got We've got it less wrong now. Ideas like animals evolve too. The saber tooth dicynodon, a turtle no more. And these were weird looking animals. They're still weird looking by today's standard. Their uh, features and morphology are strange and bizarre. Uh, and we had trouble figuring out how they were going to look when we reconstructed them. So yeah, it does still have, you can still see a little bit of... Uh, why someone would think this was a turtle skull. Just the structure of it, the angles of of it, the beak, the, yeah. There's no, I, there's, I, I'm not shaming Hawkins for looking at this skull. The, 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 this is what the artists have reconstructed based on the uh, muscle attachments and such, that this is very much convergent with the way that a turtle skull is uh, laid out. Turtles, again, have no uh, femoral finastra. Uh, but other than that, now, some of these suckers got huge. Look at this one. Uh, Lissowisia. This thing is as big as an elephant. And it, it even had a little tusk. It, it didn't have big tusks like an elephant. I wonder if it did. Maybe, maybe not. Uh, but these guys, uh, they have had some places in pop culture, of course. Let's, do they have a pop culture section on here? No, but these are a uh, great example in, in, of a, a clay that we have a lot of, a lot of uh, bones for now. Much, much more than we had at the time when Hawkins was doing his reconstruction. We have all these different species. We have, you know, entire skeletons is what we have here. Look at this, a whole skeleton with a little tusk spinal column, hip bones. We know a bit more about them now. Um, fossilized skeletons of two adult male di uh, dictodon that crawled into an underground burrow and curled up together, probably to conserve heat during winter hibernation. This was the fossil discovery that was that the Walking with the Beast episode that had the uh, uh, Dictodons uh, in it. This is the fossil that that was based on, and we were able to infer from this spinal structure and other features of this organism as well that this is a synapsid like ourselves. And as you can see right here, they are nested well within therapsids, of course, in synapsids as well. Therapsids are an interesting clay that includes organisms like the Gorgonopsid. 
and what used to be called Pecleosaurs. For a long time, this clade was called mammal-like reptiles because of their heterodont teeth. But now we uh, know that they are our close relatives. Uh, yes, saber-toothed gopher is actually what uh, what the Dictodon uh, depicted in the Walking with Beasts series uh, showed. Or was that walking? Was that Walking with Dinosaurs? Was that season one? Of, no, it was. Anyway, yeah. I, they, I mean, these guys were prominent during the Permian as well. Um, but yeah, this is what the animal actually turned out to be. But for years and years, I could not track down this origins of this saber-toothed tur turtle. And here we are. <laughs> Finally, I've tracked it down. It only took a couple decades. So good on it, right? But case closed. Case closed on the saber-toothed uh, on the saber-toothed turtle, which was a dictodont. Uh, yeah, happy. I'm happy that that's uh, that that's a chapter of my of my existence that uh, I can bring to a close. Now, as I said beforehand, I am going to try to do like a half an hour uh, or so uh, Discord hangout. Uh, if you are not a member of the Discord, I believe that uh, Bugbot has been dropping the link in the... Evolution.